I'm really not quite sure what to think of that. That's quite ambitious, applauding before a talk. Anyway, hopefully this evening um, the game is to try and certainly inform and maybe, maybe keep you entertained as well. Although, I have to confess, uh, the topic of climate repair and the reason for climate repair is hardly something to be entertained about. But we're going to see what we can do about it this evening. I thought I would start with something that probably you have all seen in the headlines in the last few days. So this was the 8th of February. And for the first time, uh, global average temperatures for a 12-month period being above 1.5 degrees centigrade. I don't know about you, but when you hear politicians talk about you know, keeping 1.5 alive, which is actually the language that was used at COP26, it's on the operating table apparently, but still alive. Well, this is suggesting something otherwise. But actually, 1.5, for the purists amongst everybody, actually what they really mean is 1.5 by the end of the century. And therefore, the hidden text is, of course, one is allowed, apparently, to do something else in the intervening period. Now, the problem that we have regarding... Um, our targets and those that are agreed at, in, in, at an international level and then those that are agreed at national level regarding policies is that there are insufficient policies right now, globally, amongst, those, amongst our countries to keep us below one and a half degrees centigrade. Um, very clearly, uh, there was the, the most recent IPCC report, um, and there were a number of them, which is uh, AR6, which was in 2021, um, saying that actually we're not going to get to net zero by 2050. And yet this language of net zero by 2050 appears to be something that is really quite important, uh, namely amongst our politicians. I'm hoping that actually today we are largely uh, filling the room with um, scientists and, and academics and students from the University of Cambridge and uh, the Greater Cambridge area, not just politicians. So you, you would excuse me for just trying to sort of delve into a bit more detail about what we really mean. So if we're going to get to net zero, there's something lovely about that word net, which is something else other than emissions reduction is going to be required. We're going to have to use greenhouse gas removal in order to at least compensate for the fact that we're going to continue emitting greenhouse gases into the future. And it isn't just because uh, somebody might say we're going to need some fossil fuels going to the future. No, there are other sources of emissions which are associated with our activities. So farming is one good example of actually being able to feed 8 billion people in the world means that we're going to need to have agricultural practices, we're going to disturb the earth, and therefore there are uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with that. And I have been greatly encouraged um, over the last few years that the UK government has announced and is investing something like £100 million into research for greenhouse gas removal. Um, for those of you with sort of a, not a very long memory, but it was Dominic Cummings uh, during the Boris Johnson era who made reference to this, the fact we're putting £100 million of money into these kinds of activities. That is to be welcomed, but is it sufficient? Well, getting to net zero by 2050, why does 2050 matter? And actually, why does the journey even to 2050 matter? Cumulative emissions are very, very important. So the way I like to think about um, the greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere is that they're a bit like your TOG value for your insulating blanket. And carbon dioxide is a very, very long-lived uh, greenhouse gas. So the more carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere, unfortunately, the warmer our climate's going to become. And therefore, for every tonne of carbon dioxide level, uh, carbon dioxide that we emit into the atmosphere, the worse things are going to become. So it is not a case of just getting to net zero by 2050. It is also the trajectory to even 2050 that matters in terms of the temperatures that we're going to experience. And this is a chart from IPCC AR6, but it's not new. We've known this for a very, very long time. So, in 1820, uh, the French mathematician Fourier, he calculated the temperature at the surface of the Earth and included a coefficient um, for the heat being retained by the Earth's atmosphere. 
And that was followed uh, in 1860 by the Irish scientist uh, Tyndall, who discovered that, in fact, the gases that are, are important are actually the minority gases, so carbon dioxide, water vapour, and uh, methane, for example. And they're the ones that we really need to worry about. And if you are interested, you can go and investigate the equipment that uh, Tyndall indeed used in the basement of the Royal Institution Laboratories. So there's now a museum. And as Dame Mary Archer uh, will tell me, because she was actually a, a researcher in the Royal Institution, and said, well, and by the way, she's also uh, chair of the, the Science Museum Group. So that's a very large uh, museum, and in fact, a series of museums. And she said to me when I was director of the Royal Institution, yes, Sean, um, the museum at the Royal Institution is small, but it's beautifully formed. So I would encourage you to go and um, have a day out in London and to go and look at this really important piece of equipment and an important piece of history regarding our understanding of climate change. And lastly, I wanted to point out that Irenaeus uh, also pointed out that a doubling of carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere will result in a 5 degree centigrade or 5 Kelvin rise. And we have lots of complicated models today, but actually Irenaeus was already on it in terms of being able to steer us in the direction of, and realising just how important um, the temperature rise was for a given amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And therefore, the longer we take to reach net zero, in other words, our trajectory, the amount of carbon dioxide that we continue to emit, the worse things are going to become. And in fact, uh, going beyond net zero means um, allowing, um, allowing not just carbon dioxide levels to reach a certain level, but then draining the atmosphere of those, because this is really, really important. If we're going to try and keep global temperatures below one and a half degrees centigrade by the end of the century, which is in fact the agreement that has been reached. And then uh, when I was in Dubai um, just before Christmas, uh, some of the headlines that you may have seen um, on COP28, so the uh, first time, for example, that the transition away from fossil fuels was agreed by all of the nations. In an, and this was agreed um, at a COP that was being hosted by uh, an oil producing nation. You might think that is actually uh, rather good news. And don't get me wrong, I think it is also good news. However, I would also counter the fact that it's on COP28, it's taken nigh on 30 years to state the obvious. That is the progress that mankind is making in terms of tackling the climate. And therefore, we need to do a lot more. And how quickly are things changing? Well, things are changing very quickly. So, for example, um, you will remember the fires in Lytton, British, British Columbia. Um, I mean, many degrees centigrade hotter than they had ever experienced before. The floods in Jakarta. This is a relatively new city that they are now having to rebuild completely. They are relocating it as a result of the flooding episodes that are just increasingly frequent, and therefore they're going, they've decided they're going, going to need to move their city. And then lastly, there are a number of rather strange phenomena up in the Siberian Arctic. And there, these are believed to have been formed as a result of methane exploding out of the ground. So as a result of the melting of the permafrost, and the, re the release of pressure, and then seeing these explosions of methane um, and causing these incredible craters. Very often they get filled with water, depending on where they are, but these are, these are ones that have not at least been filled with water at that time. So things are changing very, very rapidly. And so whilst getting to net zero is necessary, I will counter that getting to net zero is not sufficient. We need to drain the atmosphere of greenhouse gases uh, that are already there, as well as the ones that we're going to continue to emit. We also need to seriously factor in adaptation. So how are we going to uh, change our ways? How are we going to build, for example, uh, taller seawalls around countries like the United Kingdom? Think about London and the flooding risks that that's going to experience. Are we going to really just take the Thames barrier as it currently is? What are we going to do in order to protect places like London? And then, of course, uh, nations such as uh, Bangladesh, um, which are low-lying, what are we going to do for those countries? And then, lastly, we have to recognise 
that there, are, there is a further lever, which we will talk about later, which is this idea of solar radiation modification or solar radiation management, geoengineering or climate engineering or climate interventions. And at the moment, we have a great paucity of knowledge in this area, but with all of these changes happening, there is a risk. There is a risk that things like geoengineering could be tried in anger as a, as a um, basically in desperation. And that is, for me, actually is quite scary. I would rather uh, equip society with more knowledge in this space so that if people do wish to consider things like solar radiation modification, they have greater knowledge about which levers to not pull and those which are less risky. And that, for me, is... Uh, I'm a great proponent of the furtherance of knowledge in this area, and that's one of the areas of research that we will be talking about for the Centre for Climate Repair. So climate repair has three pillars. First of all, the blindingly obvious, which is to reduce emissions as hard and as fast as we absolutely can. And aren't we doing a great job? No, no. Um, actually, we're not. Do in fact, we're doing a terrible job. Every year, emissions are still going up. OK, the rate at which they are going up is decreasing, but we have not yet plateaued. We've got to go and reduce emissions. Let's just focus on that word reduce. We've got to emit less carbon dioxide from one year to the next, and we are not doing so at the moment. The second, we need to remove greenhouse gases. And then the third, we call refreeze, which is looking at other measures uh, that may be needed in order, for example, to keep the ice on Antarctica, the ice on Greenland, so that sea level rises don't go through the roof. And then we lose not only a bit of beach, we lose countries. And uh, for me, um, I heard a lady called uh, Elena Said. She's the United Nations ambassador to the islands of Palau. If you, have, if you don't know where Palau is, they're in the, in the Pacific Ocean, and they are islands formed from atolls. And uh, a number of us were at this amazing talk uh, in COP28, and she said, for my people, a one or two metre sea level rise is not a case of losing a bit of beach. Our people have no country. And therefore, if you're asking my people to sign up to just emissions reduction, recognising the amazing progress we have made thus far, not. If you're asking my people to just sign up to that when we might actually also explore other avenues to buy us a bit more time, she said, come and talk to my people about your views. And in my view, those people need, they might be a minority people, but they need a big seat at the table in terms of helping figure out what we might do globally in order to tackle climate change. So, um, this is pretty much all I'm going to talk about on emissions reduction because this talk is obviously labelled as going beyond emissions reduction. You'll see that uh, basically changing our energy mix is the biggest lever that we've got in terms of reducing emissions. So, getting away from fossil fuels. So, let's not use that. Let's use what we will call renewables. So, non-fossil fuel, non-carbon dioxide emitting sources to produce our energy, and in large part, that's going to be electricity. But what about removing of greenhouse gases? So the way I like to think about the um, opportunities that we've got to remove greenhouse gases, we have a spectrum. And we have those which are more nature-based solutions and those which are more technological. In all likelihood, uh, many of the kinds of approaches that we will be exploring are going to be a hybrid. But one example of the, a technological uh, way of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is what we call direct air capture. And direct air capture is uh, very energy hungry. So it involves uh, in, uh, blowing air over contactors, which then react with the air, and they take the carbon dioxide out of the air. You then take them through a further process and heating it up in order to release now just the carbon dioxide into a concentrated form and then get that into an underground reservoir, whether it's an old oil and gas reservoir or whether it is a deep saline aquifer. But that is an example, and that, that technology already exists, but the kinds of returns, the kinds of benefits um, that we're going to be able to increase in terms of increasing efficiency are somewhat limited. Because in this lovely department of chemistry where we are this evening, you can go and look at the thermodynamic limits as to how, as to how far you can push this. And it's going to take a lot of energy in order to get greenhouse gas levels down uh, just with things like direct air capture. And on the, on, on the other end, when we have looking at purely natural, the, the most obvious one is to go and plant a tree. Uh, but actually planting, you've got to plant the right tree in the right place and actually at the right time as well. 
But there are other natural uh, solutions which we are also interested in. And the way I like to think about getting uh, carbon dioxide or any greenhouse gas out of the atmosphere, if I come back to direct air capture, the problem with that, the main problem with that is that you're asking a lot of air to move over a small area, and that requires a lot of fan energy. I'm interested in opportunities to use lots of area where nature will then do the exchange of the gas with that area and then let the area sort itself out. And so that's why nature-based solutions, growing trees work, but actually the ocean, the ocean occupies 70% of the world surface area. And therefore, looking at the ocean as an opportunity to get this exchange flow between the atmosphere and this surface in order to get carbon dioxide into the, into the ocean. We'll worry about actually what then happens in a minute. But this is why ocean-based approaches to carbon dioxide removal, I think, are really rather exciting. And there is a body of work being done across, across Europe, across the world, by different research groups. And here at the University of Cambridge, we're part of a Horizon Europe project called CO2 CDR. It's uh, headed by uh, Dr. Chris Pierce from the National Oceanography Center at, uh, uh, in Southampton. And we're looking at not just one approach to ocean-based carbon dioxide removal, but actually looking at them all and trying to develop a framework by which different approaches to ocean-based carbon dioxide removal may be evaluated and compared. Some of them involve um, adding chemicals to the, uh, to the ocean, so trying to uh, make the ocean a bit more alkali. Um, and as a result of that, um, the, the knock-on effect will be to help draw down some carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But some of them, some of them are a little bit more nature-based. And these ones, um, the first one I'm going to uh, indicate is on the face of it, it looks a bit like chemicals, which is what we call ocean iron fertilization. And ocean iron fertilization has been, it's not a new idea, and has been around for probably a couple of decades. And there were 13 experiments that were undertaken that were inconclusive. And the idea is this, is that there are certain areas of the ocean that are rather limited in certain nutrients. And iron is one of those which is lacking in certain areas of the ocean, which means that those oceans are rather bluer than they would otherwise be if there was some iron. Because if, that, if iron were present, then it would allow phytoplankton to grow. And then phytoplankton basically is the beginning of the food web in the ocean. Phytoplankton, the zooplankton eat the, phy the phytoplankton, the, the krill eat the, cy the, the cytoplankton, the, the, the zooplankton, and so on. And the idea is this, that why? Why are certain areas of the ocean actually deficient in iron? And we don't know, but one of the reasons may well be as a result of increased um, stratification in the ocean. So it's warm, the surface waters are warmer than, than they were previously. And as a result of the increased density gradient, there is less natural mixing and the basal layers of the ocean are actually full of nutrients. So as a result of warming itself, are we actually seeing less uh, nutrient cycling and therefore less phytoplankton growing? And is that sort of a positive feedback? Secondly, um, um, when I saw artists' impressions of whaling activity from 150 years ago, um, I used to think they were just, you know, a story. But perhaps we should give our forefathers and foremothers, for that sake, um, some credit. Maybe these were not just fairy tales. Maybe these were actually what they saw in reality. And there are certain species of whales that are far, far lower in number today than, than previously. So blue whales are believed to be at only 1% of their previous number. And whales have got this incredible function, uh, is that they typically feed at depth, and they come to the surface to breathe. No, no. They come to the surface to breathe and defecate. Because it's kind of hard to defecate when you've got 500 meters of water above you. You know, the pressure is pushing on your orifices. So that's what whales do. And it may well be that whales actually provided a function of bringing nutrients from depth to the surface. So there are a number of ways. And this project that we're looking at called, uh, with, um, on ocean iron fertilization actually is better termed marine biomass regeneration. Are there things that we can do to help regenerate ecosystems within the ocean so that once the mammals are back in their plentiful numbers, you then have a natural nutrient cycling from depth to the surface. And in fact, maybe the ocean should be doing rather more for us in terms of carbon dioxide removal 
than it is at the moment, even though, even though, thankfully, the oceans are already playing a very large role. And then the second project that we are looking at at the University of Cambridge is the role of giant kelp, not giant kelp just in the conventional areas in the coastal waters, because that's where it normally grows. Don't get me wrong, regrowing kelp in the coastal regions is a really good idea, and we should be doing more of it. We've ruined uh, kelp beds in the coastal locations for activities such as boating and things like this. Oh, it gets in the way of our sort of our recreation, so we go and destroy those kelp beds. No, go and get the kelp beds in those places grown back. But what about what about kelp beds uh, being grown in the surface waters of the deep ocean? Well, you need to provide vehicles, mechanisms by which the kelp can actually latch onto and grow. And we're working with a company called Running Tide. They're based in the United States. And their model, one of their models, is actually really rather simple, which is if you have a, a buoy with a 60-foot line on it, and at the bottom of the line you've got a 5-kilogram lump of kelp, when you're 1,000 miles offshore, you can then toss the, the buoy off the back of a boat, and then nine months later that kelp has grown from 5 kilograms to 300 kilograms. But there's a trick. The buoy has a biodegradable plug in it which goes after about nine months. And therefore, after nine months, the kelp has grown, it just sinks to the bottom of the ocean. We love it. However, let's not kid ourselves. You know, is it just taking down carbon dioxide to the bottom of the ocean? Clearly not. It's taking down some nutrients. So we just need to make sure that when we get these ideas about growing uh, kelp in the surface waters of the deep ocean, we also factor in the other systems. So there's a, a gentleman called Professor John Taylor uh, and his team at the Department of Applied Mathematics here at the University of Cambridge who are looking at modelling of different models um, for growing kelp in the surface waters of the deep ocean. There's a further model which is involving, uh, idea which is involving this, uh, uh, creating a raft um, a large raft or a series of large rafts which are buoyancy controlled so that they, you can grow the kelp um, in the surface waters of the deep ocean and the great thing about these large rafts being buoyancy controlled is that they can sink the kelp um, at night into the deep water to basically have their fill of the nutrients and then raise it again the following uh, for, the, for the daylight hours because kelp only grows during the daylight hours. And there's another benefit too, which is if you're in the middle of the ocean and a weather system comes through, I mean, we might be good engineers, but it's difficult to engineer and design rafts that can withstand a hurricane. But once you go down a few metres or maybe tens of metres underneath the surface of the ocean, things are a lot more stable, even in the presence of a hurricane. So it gives you a bit more resilience to some of these structures with having buoyancy control. And the amount of energy that you need to expend for the buoyancy control is a lot less, for example, than the amount of energy that you need to put into uh, driving a fan with direct air capture. And then the last uh, one on um, greenhouse gas removal for carbon dioxide I wanted to mention is the role of soils. And uh, soils are incredible. So much as though they are a pain when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions in terms of our agricultural practices, that they are responsible for a lot of emissions, they also have the potential to not just have reduced emissions, but to be a sequester of carbon. So when we're growing crops, for example, and making sure we don't burn the stubble, but we actually allow some of the uh, material that, uh, that we've actually grown to then stay in that soil, we can start to increase the carbon content of those soils. It's a long game. We're not, we're not pretending otherwise, but uh, uh, we're working on a project called the Land Use for Net Zero at the University of Cambridge, and one of the uh, one of the researchers from Aberdeen, uh, Dr. Pete Smith, is a world leader on, for example, uh, looking at different practices in agriculture to increase the carbon content of soils. I now want to move to uh, a different greenhouse gas, which is methane. So methane is uh, very much more dilute than uh, carbon dioxide. Yes, so if you thought carbon dioxide was hard in terms, of its, uh, dense, uh, in terms of its concentration in the atmosphere. So I'm going to use some very broad brush numbers. Carbon dioxide is about 400 parts per million. Those of you uh, from the Lee School here this evening will tell me, no, it's 420 parts per million. But I'm going to use 400 just because I like to keep the math simple. Methane is about two parts per million. Again, you could say, Sean, it's 1.8. No, let's, let's use raw, round numbers. Two parts per million. So it's 200 times more dilute. But the kick is this. 
It's about a hundred times more potent as a greenhouse gas on short time scales. And at the moment, given where we are, I'm actually quite concerned about short time scales. And therefore, what we find is that methane is responsible for about a, th a third of warming to date. So it's worth going for in terms of what can we do to reduce the methane levels in the atmosphere. And what we're looking at is a, a series of materials uh, called catalysts as to whether we can get the, the air, and therefore in particular the methane in the air, in contact with these catalysts to help trigger the natural reaction, the oxidation of methane to carbon dioxide. We know that you know, it's energetically favorable to go from methane to carbon dioxide, otherwise we wouldn't be burning in our, in our, uh, in our kitchens and, and in the power stations. But the problem is that when it's very dilute, all right, the amount of heat being released by the methane is insufficient to maintain, to maintain that oxidation reaction, and therefore it doesn't actually oxidize very quickly. But in the presence of a catalyst, um, then the catalyst can help get it over the energy hump so that it can then uh, oxidize more naturally. And we're looking at different catalysts at the moment. Uh, zinc oxide with, um, is one of those, but actually the one that we're most interested in is titanium dioxide. Titanium dioxide is as old as the hills when it comes to being known as a catalyst, but it is ubiquitous in, um, in our world. So when you clean your teeth tonight, you're going, to have, you're going to be filling your mouth with titanium dioxide. The titanium dioxide in our paints, the titanium dioxide in sun cream. The great thing about this is that a lot of it, there's an industry that's already geared up to making lots of it, and if it had some serious health benefits, we'd be shouting about it already. So there are lots of things, uh, reasons to go and be excited about the opportunities for titanium dioxide. And we're interested in adding certain materials to it, nanoparticles, for example, to see whether we can increase the rate at which that catalyst can help oxidize the methane, not just by one or two percent, but by factors. And if this, if this idea works, then... For example, if we can, if we can increase the, uh, the ability of paint to oxidize methane, then the amount of paint that we use in our, in our, in our world today is enormous. But also on the, um, the outside of buildings is particularly helpful because titanium dioxide is what we call a photocatalyst. It needs an energy source as well. And the sun's radiation, UV in particular, is actually rather important. So putting it on the outside coatings of, of buildings or on glass. So I don't know whether any of you have bought any glass recently. Um, it's not something that we do a lot of, uh, but some of our companies do. And when you have buildings like the Shard, uh, a building that I worked on, uh, I didn't work on the, on the glass bit, I worked on the bits on the inside, namely the ventilation. Um, the, sh the glass that they like to use is what we call self-cleaning glass. It has a coating on it. And what's the coating that they use, uh, that NSG Pilkington use? It's titanium dioxide. So if we can try and add some materials and increase the effectiveness of the titanium dioxide for methane oxidation, and the amount of glass that we produce every year that we could therefore put coatings on is really, really exciting. And why would somebody buy this? Well, you'd buy it for the self-cleaning properties, not for the, the fact that it's awesome at knocking out methane. And therein is a really wonderful um, thing to think about, is that if you can find another reason for somebody, for somebody to buy your product and the, and the climate is a, basically a co-beneficiary, then it's gonna be far more likely to actually have a big impact. Rather than relying, for example, on a carbon price. Don't get me wrong, if we need a carbon price, we've got to go and work on that. But where there are opportunities that don't rely on a carbon price, we should get even more excited. So putting it onto the outside of buildings is one example, and that would be for a photocatalyst. But we're not just looking at photocatalysts. We're actually looking at electrocatalysts as well. And the reason is this. When I uh, started talking with Professor Adam Boys here at the engineering department, who's doing the work with uh, a postdoc called Eliki on this, we got excited, and I got particularly excited, about the idea of using photocatalysts in ventilation ducts, because I was part of the, the SAGE environmental modelling group during our period of COVID, and when everyone was getting rather exercised about the air quality in buildings and knocking out viruses, and one of the ways that was being used to knock out viruses was to install UV light sources within ventilation ducts. So I said, well, if now somebody's already paying for the UV uh, source within a ventilation duct, why don't we 
coat the, light, coat the inside of the duct with this photocatalyst, and what a great idea. But it wasn't such a great idea. The reason being is that when you design a ventilation duct, um, you're trying to make it nice and large to make it as um, basically as non-resistive as possible because you're trying to reduce the fan power being used to provide air throughout the buildings. And therefore, the amount of air that actually comes into contact with that photocatalyst would be fairly minimal because you don't need to have a UV source along the whole length of the duct. So I had to throw that away. But there's another way of tackling viruses in, in buildings, and they're called HEPA filters. Now, HEPA filters, all right, the, how they work is that they are very, a series of incredibly small holes. They're so small that they can catch a virus. They'll trap a virus. So if we were to be, now incorporate a, not a photocatalyst, but an electrocatalyst on those same HEPA filters, then we will be able to take out viruses and not just, so we'll be able to take methane out, not just viruses. And there's another thing which I like about HEPA filters, is that no matter how good we are as engineers, things only last a certain amount of time. They replace HEPA filters about every four months. So you now have maintenance already built in for the degradation of the effectiveness of the filter. So that's what we're looking at in terms of trying to get some new ideas into our buildings, our built environment, to take out methane. Although clearly the, the, what we will be selling here are HEPA filters to make us all rather more healthy in buildings, taking out viruses such as the COVID virus and indeed some other compounds as well that we might not like. We're now going to um, move on to um, the, the third R in our, in, our, um, in, our, in our sort of portfolio of climate repair, which is what we call refreeze. So we're going beyond emissions reduction and we're going beyond greenhouse gas removal. We're going to look at two big areas called solar radiation management and earth radiation management. So what I have here um, on, the, on the desk um, are some jars with, uh, with different bead sizes. And I'm hoping that you can see, let me just get this, where are we? You need to be, those at the back need to be able to see. Okay. Okay, so what you can see, one on the right, I'm hoping you'll see, is, looks whiter, certainly the, than the one on the left. So these are small beads, those are medium-sized, and those are large beads. Same material. So why? Why are these smaller beads looking whiter. And it's to do with the relationship of the bead size and the wavelength of light. That's what it is. So what we're interested in, as a result of this, is exploring the way that this works in reality, in our weather systems. And the issue is this. I mean, we've had quite a lot of rain this weekend. I was up in Manchester, um, up in the Peak District. It was really quite cloudy and misty. There was lots of it. And depending on not just the water vapour content in the atmosphere, but the size of the droplets in those clouds, they will, they will either be dark clouds or bright clouds. And the ones that have got um, small droplets in are whiter, and the ones that have got larger droplets are darker. But because of the, what we call the reflective properties of those clouds. So what you'll see on the, can I have the, this slide actually? What you'll see is that clouds perform two main functions. One is that they can reflect radiation from the sun above, but they also act as an insulator and they trap long wave radiation from the earth. And the balance of these two effects is important. So you'll know that um, during the day, uh, clouds can actually, can actually help you be a bit cool. They're protecting us from the sun. But at night, um, actually, it's when you have a clear night that you get really, really cold because the Earth is then able to radiate its heat out. So we've got these two functions that are really important. And during the day, so forget the night for the moment, during the day, clouds that, are, that have got... Uh, smaller droplets in have a higher reflectivity than those which are 
formed of larger droplets. And what we've got here, can I have the... What we've got here are two, two slabs of polystyrene. So these are my... I don't know, did anyone see the, uh, the photograph competitions um, last week? Or, um, and there was a, the, the, the polar bear on the iceberg, just absolutely magical. Well, I've got my polar bear here on the iceberg, okay? And what I'm interested in is how hot that iceberg is as a result of the sun beaming down. Right, I need a, a volunteer uh, from the audience. So a volunteer to go and take the temperature measurements for us on these icebergs. Come on then. And, the, uh, and what we've got here are, are a series of beads that are small diameter and a series of beads that are large diameter. And we're going to look at the temperatures being experienced on these icebergs as a function of the different bead size, which is therefore the different droplet size in our clouds. Right. The idea is if you can just point the red beam onto the surface of the white and tell me what you read. Have you just pulled the trigger? I have. Oh, there we are. I can see it now. 25.7. 25 25.7. 25 25 we'll go for 7. It's going 25.7. Now let's yeah. do the other one. Oh, 26.5 and drop. 26, 20, 26.3. 26 so these, the ones with the, drop, with the larger droplets. Can I go and sit down? You may. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> so what we have is the, the, the iceberg being shielded by the cloud formed of larger droplets is warmer than the iceberg being shielded from the sun with the smaller droplets. And that's because the reflectivity of the clouds formed with smaller droplets is higher. It reflects more of the energy away. Can I have the slide back, please? So, what we're interested in doing is learning from nature how to make the most of these sorts of properties. And what we have on the right-hand side here are First of all, what happens over the ocean is that cloud banks do form. But they don't form as readily as they do over land because there, is, there are less what we call cloud condensation nuclei. There are lots over land, aerosols from industrial processes from the land and, 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 and nature as well. Over the ocean, certainly away from the coasts, there is very little. Um, but where there are some, it are bit where ships have gone through and emitted a whole heap of junk from their funnels and that is causing cloud banks to form. So these are cloud condensation nuclei. And what we're interested in there for doing is whether we can generate more cloud condensation nuclei over the oceans, but they need to be of the right size. And what we're interested in, in particular, is a certain size range of, of cloud droplets, or of seawater droplets, which then evaporate to form crystals of sodium chloride that get convected up naturally into the Earth's atmosphere and then act as those cloud condensation nuclei. The game afoot is can we make clouds to, to be formed of more smaller droplets rather, rather than fewer larger ones? And it also has the benefit is that if they are formed of more smaller droplets, those clouds will likely last longer too. They won't rain out as quickly. Now... We are working on a project with a whole bunch of collaborators. We have modelers from the Technical University of Delft. There are others around the world that we're, that we're working with on this project called Marine Cloud Brightening. And the, the project that we have got going is to try and figure out whether we can form droplets of seawater in an energy efficient way that's robust. The way that we do it today is basically using snow blowers, so pumping water and air to a high pressure, and it requires a lot of energy. Where, and, mo and a lot of that energy is about pressurizing the air to the same level of pressurizing the water. We're interested in whether we can use different methods. And we've got students in the, uh, PhD students at the Center for Climate Repair, a number of whom in the audience tonight, looking at what we call uh, a superheated sprayer, as well as an electrospray, as well as just a pressurized water system through very, very small holes and with a vibrating pressure pulse behind that. 
in order to see whether we can generate monodispersed droplets at the sufficient rate in order to create cooling for the world. Certainly cooling over the Arctic, but for the world would be where we're headed. The kind of number that we're looking at is something like 10 to the 20 droplets per second in order to have a cooling effect which is equivalent to the warming that we've experienced to date. I think it's unlikely that we're going to be able to do that tomorrow, but this, the, the plan is to explore whether we might be able to find different ways of generating droplets than they're currently using with snowblowers. Now, um, what I wanted to do is just introduce you to our colleague, So that is Dan Harrison from Southern Cross University and uh, the postdoctoral researcher at the, the Centre for Climate Repair under the direction of Professor Hugh Hunt is over the Great Barrier Reef as we speak on campaign number three with Dan Harrison, um, basically taking measurements from the droplet generation technique that they are currently using, whereas what we're hoping to do over the next 12 months is to be able to equip them with a different, completely different way of generating droplets that is A, a lot more uh, energy efficient, and importantly, is uh, uh, a, narrower, a narrower droplet size range. And the, and the reason why this is important is that if you create lots of droplets of seawater that have got large crystals, you might end up creating larger droplets, and therefore the cloud can rain out. And conversely, if you create lots and lots of small droplets, really, really small droplets, they will then form very, very small crystals of sodium chloride. And in fact, what's possible is that what would have been a cloud then transforms into a haze. And a haze isn't as reflective as a cloud. So there seems to be a Goldilocks zone of, of droplet sizes, and hence that's why we're trying to sort of be a narrower range that we can then tweak to figure out how we might be able to help marine cloud brightening. We're now going to talk about um, a further way of uh, looking at um, protecting the Arctic and um, whether we might be able to buy a bit more time to create more sea ice in the Arctic winter. And the reason why this is important is that when the ice melts over the Arctic summer, it exposes uh, dark blue ocean and the reflectivity difference between ice covering the sea and sea covering the sea is about a factor of nine. So if we can create more sea ice in the Arctic winter and thereby create uh, um, more ice over the whole of the year on average, that will be a very, very good thing for the Arctic. And one way of doing that you can think of is having ships that just scoop up the ice because once the ice forms for about a, a metre, then it's going to stay for, about a, stay, stay for the summer. So if we can scoop up some of the ice and make it thicker, it will last longer. And if you did that halfway through the winter, then what will happen is that you'll get more sea ice forming in the, in the bit that you've just cleared. That's one way of doing it. But in fact, what we find, importantly, is that the way that sea ice forms is as follows. The sea ice, when it forms floats on the water, and the, uh, the new ice accumulates at the bottom of the sea ice. And if you think about it, if it's a cold Arctic night, and it's night nearly all the time um, in, in the winter, the air temperature is about minus 20 degrees centigrade. Imagine there are no clouds in the Arctic winter. The surface 
at which you are radiating heat out, of, out to space is minus 20 degrees centigrade. If we were to pump seawater on top of the ice and have the ice being formed at the top of the sea ice rather than at the bottom of the sea ice, the new surface that you've created is no longer at minus 20 degrees centigrade. It's at zero. And we all know from black body radiation that you radiate more heat out to space or radiate more heat when you raise the temperature of the surface from which you are emitting heat. So what we're interested in doing is understanding whether the, pump, the action of pumping seawater on top of sea ice can allow more sea ice to form. So this is the idea. We have a lump of ice and we have, um, um, we've drilled a hole through it and then we're going to pump seawater on top of the sea ice to flood the top and then have the freezing predominantly occurring at the top of the sea ice rather than underneath it. And there was some work done in 2016 by a group called, by, uh, led by a gentleman called Desh et al. And what they found out was that, uh, from their modelling alone, was that yes, if you pump seawater on top of sea ice, you create more ice on top and you reduce the rate at which ice forms underneath. That is as you would expect. And they ran some numbers to say that actually if you were to put 10 million pumps um, over the Arctic, you would then cover about 10% of the Arctic, and that would be of benefit according to their modelling results. Well, modelling only takes you so far, therefore we have complemented that by doing some experiments. Uh, in the, this is actually in the, um, the meat freezer at, the, at Trinity College, because that was the walk-in freezer. We're now using the cold room at Damped, but the initial experiments were in the freezer at Trinity. And this is the kind of work that we were doing, pumping water on top of ice. And what was surprising was that we couldn't find any papers that did a good job at explaining these physical processes of freezing on top of ice. Lots about freezing from below. And the idea is clearly to try and have newly formed water on top. But by definition, the temperature of the water that you're then pump, you pump on top of ice is unlikely to be zero exactly. It's certainly not below zero, otherwise it's what we call either supercooled or a solid. What's really interesting um, is we found that when you have minus 20 degrees C ice, the first thing that happens no matter what temperature, actually, of water that you put on top of that ice, if it's, say, minus 20 degrees, the very first thing that happens is that some of that water freezes. And, then, and that, the reason is that the temperature gradient, you've introduced a shock. You've introduced water at one temperature onto minus 20 degrees C ice, and it's a shock which is so, so hard that it takes heat out of the water and it forms a new ice layer. But as that temperature gradient weakens, you then melt some of the ice that you've just formed, and then you start to melt some of the ice that was originally there as well. And that happens, the reason we care about this is that it happens in the vicinity of the place where you are supposedly putting this pump and pumping seawater on top of sea ice. So you get this sort of the idea, new ice forms, it then melts, and then you start melting the original ice just in the vicinity of the, uh, the injection point. I know how to get, get to get round that. You maybe just do a bit of spraying just to ensure that you cool the water down to the freezing point. You're not asking um, the air to do all the freezing for you. You're just taking a bit of heat out of it to reduce it to its freezing temperature and then get it to flood over the ice and get radiation to do the heavy lifting for you. And we've done, um, uh, Jacob in the audience has done some experiments together with Katie. They've done some experiments looking at different theories and showing that actually I think we do have a reasonable understanding of the process by which you get, uh, uh, you get freezing and then melting in the vicinity of the injection point, but you always get freezing further away from the point of injection. And then... We are also doing some models, not just with a channel flow, but a beautifully radial flow. The reality, as you will see in a minute, is that nature is somewhere between the two, depending on the morphology of the ice. So we've looked at the end members to try and get an understanding of these different processes. And the radial experiments are underway at the moment, but importantly, this is also going on. So Jacob has literally just come back.
So you'll see, that was the first experiment. Um, this was last year uh, in Alaska, where they were pumping seawater on top of sea ice. The group that we've been working with is called Real Ice. Um, and they've been out there try just trying to understand and figure out what happens when you pump seawater on top of sea ice. It didn't always quite li look like that. This was actually another day, which is rather more pleasant, um, working in the Arctic. And uh, they've just come back from um, uh, doing some similar experiments in the Canadian High Arctic now, not just Alaska, the Can Canadian High Arctic in Cambridge Bay. I wanted to finish um, by saying that the work at the Centre for Climate Repair goes beyond uh, just physical experiments and physical understanding. But um, as I mentioned right at the very beginning, uh, we have a paucity of knowledge in this space. And we also, therefore, I think we need to really progress our understanding of what it would take to repair the climate. But not everybody um, has been supportive of even research in this area. So um, we did some, uh, did some research, um, and Ramit, who's in the audience, uh, uh, led this work, which was looking um, at attitudes towards this general, uh, general um, area called geoengineering. And what we found was that the, um, we, we used Twitter um, data as our, sort of, as our data source, not because we think it's a brilliant data source, because it's just representative of one small section of society, but it was because um, it was, A, uh, 13 years' worth of data that we were able to then mine using some of the algorithms supported by others. There's work going on now to look at different data sources. But nevertheless, there are some interesting, interesting tales First of all, what we find is that the, the, the number of expressions of interest in this area, and that could be positive or negative, uh, is often uh, correlated with announcements of when somebody's going to be doing something or the, uh, the issuance of a report. And that was interesting. I was a bit surprised, by the way, that the balance between generally positive and generally negative was not as heavily negative as I had been led to believe through discussions in this space. Actually, there was a reasonable amount of positive and, and the blue being neutral here. But what we found was that as a result of uh, looking at these negative comments, um, we asked the question, I wonder what else those people are talking about. Very simple. And what we found was really quite alarming. And we found that the same voices on Twitter, let's be absolutely clear, this is just with Twitter, um, are also commenting on things, for example, chemtrails, MAGA, Trump, anti-vaxxers. And that what we found was that there was a spillover in the, uh, in, the, in the conversations between very, very different topics, but actually the, this area being hampered, potentially. And therefore, what we wanted to do was to ensure that those, the, those of us who then read and uh, commentary in the space about geoengineering, climate engineering, are just aware of the answer to the question, I wonder what else they're talking about. Because it might inform what, what level of credence we wish to place on different voices, because it's really important that we hear from a diversity of voices. As I mentioned at the very beginning, thinking about that, the, uh, the United Nations ambassador to the islands of Palau. And I think that's something that we can all do more of by making sure that we have more open and honest conversations about these different three R's, the, the emissions reduction, greenhouse gas removal, and the refreeze activity going forwards. And with that, I was going to close, and I hope that has at least given you some flavour for our work on the issue of climate repair here in Cambridge. Thank you.